Hello, and welcome to the reading of The Giver by Lois Lowry. My name is Mrs. Hansen, and I'll be reading the book to you today. I've been a middle school teacher for many years now, and I have to say I just love this book. After reading the chapter, I'm going to give you a little summary and some, import and some important things to think about as we move forward in the book. These might help you if you have to write a book report or an essay for your class. In a nutshell, the book is about a young boy named Jonas who lives in a highly controlled community set in the future. Imagine a world with no love, no hate, no envy, no emotions. The novel fits into a larger genre of dystopian literature. Lois Lowry portrays a utopian society where everything is perfect, or isn't. In a dystopian society, everything goes wrong. Follow along in your book and please feel free to ask questions in the comments if you have any questions. Please don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you'd like to hear more books and more chapters about Thank you and enjoy the book. The Giver by Lois Lowry, Chapter 1. It was almost December and Jonas was beginning to be frightened. No, wrong word. Jonas thought frightened meant that deep sickening feeling of something terrible about to happen. Frightened was the way he had felt a year ago when an unidentified aircraft had overflown the community twice. He had seen it both times, squinting towards the sky. He had seen the sleek jet, almost a blur at its high speed, go past, and a second later heard the blast of a sound that followed. Then one more time. A moment later, from the opposite direction, the same plane. At first he had only been fascinated. He'd never seen an aircraft so close, for it was against the rules for pilots to fly over the community. Occasionally, when supplies were delivered by cargo plane to the landing field across the river, the children rode their bicycles to the riverbank and watched, intrigued, the unloading and the takeoff directed to the west, always away from the community. But the aircraft a year ago had been different. It was not a squat, fat-bellied cargo plane, but a needle-nosed single pilot jet. Jonas, looking around anxiously, had seen others, adults as well as children, stop what they were doing and wait, confused, for an explanation of the frightening event. Then all of the citizens had been ordered to go into the nearest building and stay there. Immediately, the rasping voice through the speakers had said, Leave your bicycles where they are. Instantly, obediently, Jonas had dropped his bike on its side of the path behind his family's dwelling. He had run indoors and stayed there alone. His parents were both at work, and his little sister Lily was at the child care center where she spent her after-school hours. Looking through the front window, he had seen no people, None of the busy afternoon crew of street cleaners, landscape workers, and food delivery people who usually populated the community at that time of the day. He saw only the abandoned bikes here and there on their sides, an upturned wheel on one was still revolving slowly. He'd been frightened then. The sense of his own community silent, waiting, had made his stomach churn. He had trembled. But it had been nothing. Within minutes, the speaker had crackled again, and the voice, reassuring now and less urgent, had explained that a pilot in training had misread his navigational instructions and made a wrong turn. Desperately, the pilot had been trying to make his way back before his error was noticed. Needless to say, he will be released, the voice had said, following by silence. There was an ironic tone to that final message, as if the speaker found it amusing, and Jonas had smiled a little, though he knew what a grim statement it had been. For a contributing citizen to be released from the community was a final decision, a terrible punishment, an overwhelming statement of failure. Even the children were scolded if they used the term lightly at play, jeering at a teammate who missed a catch or stumbled in a race. Jonas had done it once, had shouted at his best friend, That's it, Asher, you're released, when Asher's clumsy error had lost a match for his team. He had been taken aside for a brief and serious talk by the coach had hung his head with guilt and embarrassment and apologized to Asher after the game. Now thinking about the feeling of fear as he pedaled home along the river path, he remembered that moment of palpable stomach-sinking terror when the aircraft had streaked above. It was not what he was feeling now with December approaching. He searched for the right word to describe his feeling. Jonas was careful about language, not like his friend Asher, who talked too fast and mixed things up scrambling words and phrases until they were barely recognizable and often very funny. Jonas grinned, remembering that morning that Asher had dashed into the classroom, late as usual, arriving breathlessly in the middle of the chanting of the morning anthem. When the class took their seats at the conclusion of the patriotic hymn, Asher remained standing to make his public apology, as was required. I apologize for inconveniencing my learning community. Asher ran through the standard apology phrase rapidly, still catching his breath. The instructor in class waited patiently for his explanation. The students had all been grinning because they had listened to Asher's explanations so many times before.
I left home at the correct time, but when I was riding along at near the hatchery, the crew was separating some salmon. I guess I just got distraught watching them. I apologized to my classmates, Asher concluded. He smoothed his rumpled tunic and sat down. We accept your apology, Asher. The class recited the standard response in unison. Many of the students were biting their lips to keep them laughing. <clears throat> I accept your apology, Asher, the instructor said. He was smiling, and I thank you, because once again, you've provided an opportunity for a lesson in language. Distraught is too strong an adjective to describe salmon viewing. He turned and wrote distraught on the instructional board. Beside it, he wrote distracted. Jonas, nearing his home now, smiled at the recollection. Thinking still as he wheeled his bike into his narrow port beside the house, he realized that frightened was the wrong word to describe his feelings. Now that December was almost here, it was just too strong an adjective. He had waited a long time for this special December, and now that it was almost upon him, he wasn't frightened, but he was eager, he decided. He was eager for it to come, and he was excited, certainly. All of the Elevens were excited about the event that was, would be coming soon. But there was a little shudder of nervousness when he thought about it, about what might happen. Apprehensive, Jonas decided. That's what I am. Who wants to be the first for feelings tonight? Jonas's father asked at the conclusion of their evening meal. It was one of the rituals, the evening telling of feelings. Sometimes Jonas and his sister Lily argued over turns, over who would get to go first. Their parents, of course, were part of the ritual. They too told their feelings each evening, but like all parents, all adults, they didn't fight and whittle for their turn. Nor did Jonas tonight. His feelings were just too complicated this evening. He wanted to share them, but he wasn't eager to begin the process of sifting through his own complicated emotions, even with the help that he knew his parents would give. You go, Lily, he said, seeing his sister who was much younger, only a seven, wiggling with impatience in her chair. I felt very angry this afternoon, Lily announced. My childcare group was at the play area, and we, had vis we were visited by a group of sevens, and they didn't obey the rules at all. One of them, a male, I don't know his name, kept going right to the front of the line for the slide, even though the rest of us were all waiting. I felt so angry at him, I made a fist with my hand like this, and she held up a clenched fist, and the rest of the family smiled at her small, defiant gesture. Why do you think the visitor didn't obey the rules, Mother asked. Lily considered and shook her head. I don't know. They acted like, like animals, Jonas suggested, and then he laughed. That's right, Lily said, laughing too, like animals. Well, neither children actually knew what the word meant exactly, but it was often used to describe someone uneducated or clumsy, someone who didn't fit in. Where were the visitors from, Father asked. Lily frowned, trying to remember. Our leader told us when he made the welcome speech, but I can't remember. I guess I wasn't paying attention. It was from another community. They had to leave very early, and they had their midday meal on the bus. Mother nodded. Do you think it's possible that their rules may be different, and so they simply didn't know what your play, rule areas, play area rules were? Lily shrugged and nodded. I suppose. You're visited, you've visited other communities, haven't you, Jonas? asked. My group has often. Lily nodded again. Well, when we were sixes, we went and shared a whole school day with a group of sixes in their community. Well, how did you feel when you were there? Lily frowned. Well, I felt strange because their methods were different. They were learning usages that my group hadn't learned yet, so we felt stupid. Father was listening with interest. I'm thinking, Lily, he said, about the boy who didn't obey the rules today. Do you think it's possible that he felt strange and stupid, being in a new place with rules that he didn't know about? Lily pondered that. Yes, she said finally. I feel a little sorry for him, Jonas said, even though I don't even know him. I feel sorry for anyone who's in a place where he feels strange and stupid. How do you feel now, Lily? Father asked. Still angry? I guess not, Lily decided. I guess I feel a little sorry for him, and I'm sorry I made a fist. She grinned. Jonas smiled back at his sister. Lily's feelings were always straightforward, fairly simple, and usually easy to resolve. He guessed that his own had been too when he was a seven. He listened politely, through not, though not very attentively, while his father took his turn, describing a feeling of worry that he'd had that day at work, a concern about one of the new children who wasn't doing well. Jonas's father father's title was nurturer. He and the other nurturers were responsible for all the physical and emotional needs of every new child during his earliest life. It was a very important job, Jonas knew, but it wasn't one that interested him much. Well, what gender is it? Lily asked. Male, father said. He's a sweet little male with a lovely disposition, but he isn't growing as fast as he should, and he doesn't sleep soundly. 
we have him in the extra care section for supplementary nurturing, but the committee's beginning to talk about releasing him. Oh, no, Mother murmured sympathetically. I know how sad that must make you feel. Jonas and Lily both nodded sympathetically as well. Release of new children was always sad, because they hadn't had a chance to enjoy life within the community yet, and they hadn't done anything wrong. There were only two occasions of release, which were not punishments. Release of the elderly, which is a time of celebration for a life well and fully lived, and release of a new child, which always brought a sense of what could have been, what could have been done. This was especially troubling for the nurturers, like Father, who felt they had failed somehow, but it happened very rarely. Well, Father said, I'm going to keep trying. I may ask the committee for permission to bring him at here at night, if you don't mind. You know what the night crew nurturers are like. I think this guy needs a little something extra. Of course, Mother said, and Jonas and Lily nodded. They had heard their father complain about the night crew before. It was a lesser job, night crew nurturing, assigned to those who lacked the interest or skills or insight for the more vital jobs of the daytime hours. Most of the people in the night crew had not even begin, been given spouses because they lacked somehow the essential capacity to connect to others, which was required for the creation of a family unit. Maybe we could keep him, Lily suggested sweetly, trying to look innocent. The look was fake. Jonas knew. They all knew. Lily, Mother reminded her, smiling, you know the rules. Two children, one male, one female, to each family unit. It was written very clearly in the rules. Lily giggled. Well, she said, I thought maybe just this once. Next, Mother, who held a prominent position at the Department of Justice, talked about her feelings. Today, a repeat offender had been brought before her, someone who had broken the rules before, someone who she had hoped had been adequately and fairly punished and who had been restored to his place, to his job, his home, his family unit. To see him brought before her a second time caused her overwhelming feelings of frustration and anger, and even guilt, that she hadn't made a difference in his life. I feel frightened too for him. You know that there's no third chance, she confessed. The rules said that if there's a third transgression, he simply has to be released. Jonas shivered. He knew, when, he knew it happened. There was a boy in his group of 11s whose father had been released years before. No one ever mentioned it. The disgrace was unspeakable. It was hard to imagine. Lily stood up and went to her mother, and she stroked her mother's arm. From his place at the table, father reached over and took her hand. Jonas reached for the other. One by one, they comforted her. Soon, she smiled, thanked them, and murmured that she felt soothed. The ritual continues. Jonas, father asked, you're last tonight. Jonas sighed. The evening is, this evening, he almost would have preferred to keep his feelings hidden, but it was, of course, against the rules. I'm feeling apprehensive, he confessed glad that the appropriate descriptive word had finally come to him. Why is that, son? His father looked concerned. I know there's really nothing to worry about, Jonas explained, and that every adult has been through it. I know that, I, that, I know that you, father, and you too, mother, but it's the ceremony that I'm apprehensive about. It's almost December. Lily looked up, her eyes wide. The ceremony of twelve, she whispered in an awed voice. Even the smallest children, Lily's age and younger, knew that it lay in the future for each of them. I'm glad you told us your feelings, father said. Lily, mother said, beckoning to the little girl. Go on now and get into your night clothes. Father and I are going to stay here and talk to Jonas for a while. Lily sighed, but obediently she put down. She got down from her chair. Privately, she asked. Mother nodded. Yes, she said. This talk will be a private one with Jonas. And that's the end of this chapter. So now that we finish chapter one, just a few things to remember from this chapter. So the first thing is that Jonas lives in a place called the community, where supplies are brought in by cargo planes. And one day, a jet plane flies over the community, and everyone's frightened. The voice on the speaker orders everyone to go inside immediately. Then the voice announces that the pilot has made a mistake and that he will be released. We still don't really know what that means completely yet, but we'll find out a little bit later. We get the impression in the first chapter that this is a highly controlled society. The citizens all have special roles and jobs. You remember that Jonas mentioned things like there were landscapers and food delivery people. So we know that everybody has a role in the society. Number four, everyone's very careful about language. The words they use must be precise. I mean, if you remember in the chapter, Jonas really agonized over the proper word to use about how he was feeling about the ceremony. Uh, he finally came up with apprehensive, which, which took him some time to think through it. And he also talked about Asher and his use of of language is not so careful and the teacher made a, an example of him. And the last thing that I'm in for this slide is that Jonas is 11 and we know that it's about November now in the story and in December there's going to be a very special ceremony for all the 11s and that's kind of why he's feeling apprehensive. 
So in this chapter, we also learn about how the dinner ritual where each member of the family shares their feelings. Each member talks about something that happened during the day and how it made them feel. Uh, each person goes and you hear from uh, Lily and her problem on the playground. You hear from the mother and, and uh, a case that she's working on and then the father with the, the baby that's having a difficult time. Uh, we also learn in this chapter that there's three ways of being released from the community. The first is for punishment, the second is for the very old, and the third is for newborns who for some reason can't be raised in the community. And this goes back to what his father was talking about. Uh, number eight, we learned that the rules state that families can only have one male and one female child per unit. Two children, one male, one female to each family unit. It was clearly written in the rules. That's a quote from the book. You might want to use that in one of your essays. Uh, and then the last one is that Jonah shares his feelings of apprehension with his family, and they do that privately. Uh, and you'll find out next chapter how that goes. The Giver, Chapter 2. Jonas watched as his father poured a fresh cup of coffee. He waited. You know, his father finally said, every December was exciting to me when I was young, and it has been for you and Lily too, I'm sure. Each December brings such changes. Jonas nodded. He could remember the Decembers back to when he had become, well, probably a four. The earlier ones were lost to him. But he observed them each year, and he remembered Lily's earliest Decembers. He remembered when his family received Lily, the day she was named, the day that she had become a one. The ceremony for the ones was always noisy and fun, each December, all the new children born in the previous year turned one, one at a time. There were always 50 in each year's group, if none had been released. They had been brought to the stage by their nurturers who had cared for them since birth. Some were already walking, wobbly on their unsteady legs. Others were no more than a few days old, wrapped in blankets, held by their nurturer. I enjoy the naming, Jonas said. His mother agreed, smiling. The year we got Lily, we knew, of course, that we'd receive our female, but we'd made our application and had been because we'd made our application and had been approved. But I'd been wondering and wondering what her name would be. I could have sneaked a look at the list prior to the ceremony. Father confided, "The committee always makes the list in advance, and it's right there in the office at the nurturing center." As a matter of fact, he went on, "I feel a little guilty about this, but I did go in this afternoon and look to see if this year's naming list had been made yet." It was right there in the office, and I looked up number 36. That's the little guy I've been concerned about. Because it occurred to me that it might enhance his nurturing if I could call him by his name. Just privately, of course, when no one else is around. Did you find it? Jonas asked. He was fascinated. It didn't seem a terribly important rule, but the fact that his father had broken a rule at all awed him. He glanced at his mother, the one responsible for adherence to the rules, and was relieved that she was smiling. His father nodded. His name, if he makes it to the naming without being released, of course, is to be Gabriel. So I whisper that to him when I feed him every four hours and during exercise and playtime, if no one else can hear me. I call him Gabe, actually, he said, and grinned. Gabe, Jonas tried it out. A good name, he decided. Though Jonas had only one had only become a five the year that they had acquired Lily and learned her name, he remembered the excitement, the conversations at home, wondering about her, how she would look who she would be, how she would fit into their established family unit. He remembered climbing the steps to the stage with his parents, his father by his side that year instead of with the nurturers, since it was the year that he would be given a new child of his own. He remembered his mother taking the new child, his sister, into her arms while the document was read to the assembled family units. New child 23, the namer had read, Lily. He remembered his father's look of delight and that his father had whispered, she's one of my favorites. I was hoping for her to be the one. The crowd had clapped and Jonas had grinned. He liked his sister's name. Lily, barely awake, had waved her first small, her small fist. Then they had stepped down to make room for the next family unit. When I was an 11, his father said now, as you are, Jonas, I was very impatient, waiting for the ceremony of 12. It's a long two days. I remember that I enjoyed the ones, as I always do, but that I didn't pay attention to the other ceremonies, except for my sister's. She became a nine that year and got her bicycle. I'd been teaching her to ride mine, even though technically I wasn't supposed to. Jonas laughed. It was one of the few rules that was not taken very seriously and almost always broken. The children all received their bikes, bicycles at nine. They were not allowed to ride bicycles before then, but almost always the older brothers and sisters had secretly taught the younger ones. Jonas had been thinking already about teaching Lily. There was talk about changing the rule and giving the bicycle at an earlier age. A committee was studying the idea. When something went to a committee for study, the people always joked about it. They said that the committee members would become elders by the time the, rules made, the rule change was made. 
Rules were very hard to change. Sometimes, if it was a very important rule, unlike the one governing the age for bicycles, it would have to go, eventually, to the receiver for a decision. The receiver was the most important elder. Jonas had never seen him that he knew of. Someone in a position of such importance lived and worked alone. But the committee would never bother the receiver with a question about bicycles. They would simply fret and argue about it themselves for years until the citizens forgot that it had ever gone to, the st to them for study. His father continued, So I watched and cheered when my sister Katya became a nine and removed her hair ribbons and got her bicycle, father went on. Then I didn't pay much attention to the tens and elevens. And finally, at the end of the second day, which seemed to go on forever, it was my turn. It was the ceremony of twelve. Jonas shivered. He pictured his father, who must have been a shy and quiet boy, for he was a shy and quiet man, seated in his group, waiting to be called to the stage. The ceremony of twelve was the last of the ceremonies, the most important. I remember how proud my parents looked, and my sister too. Even though she wanted to be out riding the bicycle publicly, she stopped fidgeting and was very still and attentive when my turn came. But to be honest, Jonas, his father said, for me, there was not the element of suspense that there is with your ceremony, because I was already fairly certain of what my assignment was going to be. Jonas was surprised. There was no way really to know in advance. It was a secret selection made by the, the leaders of the community, the Committee of Elders, who took the responsibility to seriously so seriously that there were never even any jokes made about assignments. His mother seemed surprised too. How could you have known, she asked. His father smiled his gentle smile. Well, it was clear to me, and my parents later confessed that it had been obvious to them too, what my aptitude was. I had always loved the new children more than anything. When my friends in my age group were holding bicycle races or building toy vehicles or bridges with their construction sets or, you know, all the things I do with my friends, Jonas pointed out, and his mother nodded in agreement. I always participated, of course, because as children, we must experience all those things. And I studied hard in school, as you do, Jonas. But again and again, during free time, I found myself drawn to the new children. I spent almost all my volunteer hours helping at the nurturing center. Of course, the elders knew that from their observations. Jonas nodded. During the past year, he had been aware of the increasing level of observation. In school, at recreation time, and during volunteer hours, he had noticed the elders watching him and the other elevens. He had seen them taking notes. He knew, too, that the elders were meeting for long hours with all the instructors that he and the other elevens had had during their school years. So I expected it, and I was pleased, but not at all surprised, when my assignment was announced as nurturer, father explained. Did everyone applaud, even though they weren't surprised, Jonas asked? Oh, of course. They were happy for me that my assignment was what I wanted most. I felt very fortunate, his father smiled. Were any of the elevens disappointed your year, your year Jonas asked? Unlike his father, he had no idea what his assignment would be, but he knew that some would be disappointed. Though he respected his father's work, nurturer would not be his wish, and he didn't envy laborers at all. His father thought, no, I don't think so. Of course, the elders are always so careful in their observations and selections. I think it's, it's probably the most important job in our community, his mother commented. My friend Yoshiko was surprised by her selection at doctor, as doctor, father said, but she was thrilled. And let's see, there was Andre. I remember that when we were boys, he never wanted to do physical things. He spent all the recreation time he could with his construction set, and his volunteer hours were always on building sites. The elders knew that, of course. Andre was given the assignment of engineer, and he was delighted. Andre later designed the bridge that crosses the river to the west of town, Jonas's mother said. It wasn't there when we were children. There are very rarely disappointments, Jonas. I don't think you need to worry about that. His father reassured him, and if there are, you know there's always an appeal process. But they all laughed at that. An appeal went to a committee for a study. I was a little worried about Asher's assignment. I worry a little bit about Asher's assignment, Jonas confessed. Asher's such fun, but he doesn't really have any serious interests. He makes a game out of everything. His father chuckled. You know, he said, I remember when Asher was a new child at the nurturing center before he was named. He never cried. He giggled and laughed at everything. All of us at the staff enjoyed nurturing Asher. The elders know Asher, his mother said. They'll find exactly the right assignment for him. I don't think you need to worry about him. But Jonas, let me warn you about something that may not have occurred to you. I know I didn't think about it until after my ceremony of 12. What's that? Well, it's the last of the ceremonies, as you know. After 12, age isn't important. Most of us even lose track of how old we are as time passes, though the information is in the Hall of Open Records, and we could go look it up if we wanted to. What's important is the preparation for adult life and the training you'll receive in your assignment. I know that, Jonas said. Everyone knows that. But it means, his mother went on, that you'll move into a new group, and each of your friends will too. 
You'll no longer be spending your time with your group of 11s. After the ceremony of 12, you'll be with your assignment group, with those in training. No more volunteer hours. No more recreation hours, so your friends will no longer be as close. Jonas shook his head. Asher and I will always be friends, he said firmly, and there will there'll still be school. Well, that's true, his father agreed. But what your mother says is true. There will be changes. Good changes, though? His mother, good changes, though, his mother pointed out. After my ceremony of 12, I missed my childhood recreation, but when I entered my training for law and justice, I found myself with people who shared my interests. I made friends on a new level, friends of all ages. Did you stay, still play at all after 12, Jonas asked. Occasionally, she, his mother replied, but it didn't seem as important to me. I did, his father said, laughing. I still do, every day at the nurturing center. I play bounce on the knee, peekaboo, and hug a teddy. He reached over and stroked Jonas's neatly trimmed hair. Fun doesn't end when you become 12. Lily appeared wearing her night clothes in the doorway. She gave an impatient sigh. This is certainly a very long private conversation, she said, and there are certain people waiting for their comfort object. Lily, her mother said fondly, you're very close to being an eight. When you're an eight, your comfort object will be taken away. It will be recycled to the younger children. You should be starting to go off to sleep without it. But her father had already gone to the shelf and taken down the stuffed elephant, which was kept there. Many of the comfort ob objects, like Lily's, were soft, stuffed, imaginary creatures. Jonas, Jonas's had been called a bear. Here you are, Lily Billy, he said. I'll come help you receive, remove your hair ribbons. Jonas and his mother rolled their eyes, yet they watched affectionately as Lily and her father headed to their sleeping room, her sleeping room with their stuffed elephant that had been given to her as her comfort object when she was born. His mother moved to her, moved to her big desk and opened her briefcase. Her work never seemed to end, even when she was at home in the evening. Jonas went to his own desk and began to sort through his school papers for the evening's assignment. But his mind was still on December and the, opening, and the coming ceremony. Though he had been reassured by the talk with his parents, he hadn't the slightest idea what assignment the elders would be selecting for his future, or how he might feel about it when the day came. And that's the end of the chapter. Some important things to remember from chapter two. So Jonas's parents were helping him with his apprehension about the ceremony of 12. We heard his dad's uh, recalling of his own ceremony and what he felt and some of the other people that were receiving their jobs that year and that he wasn't surprised by his assignment and why. Uh, we learned that babies get their names when they turn one. We learned that there's 50 of them that get assigned to families. Jonas's father sneaks a peek at the list and finds out Gabriel's name. They call him Gabe. Uh, the ceremonies take place over two days in December each year, and something special happens at each of the ceremonies. Uh, for example, we know that the nines get their bicycle, and that we also know that no one has individual birthdays, that the ceremony is the birthday for everyone. We learn that rules are decided by the elders in the community. Uh, we also learn that at the end of the ceremony of 12, everyone finds out their job assignments, and that's what's making Jonas apprehensive. He doesn't know what kind of assignment he's going to get. Uh, in the end of the chapter, Lily asks for her comfort object, which is a stuffed elephant. Her mother reminds her, though, that when she becomes a nine, she's going to have to give up her comfort object, and that goes to be recycled for the new ones that will be coming along. And then at the end of the conversation, at the end of the chapter, the conversation is over, but uh, Jonas still really has no idea what his assignment's going to be or what profession he's going to get. So his apprehension, I think, has probably not gone away completely, but I think he's starting to feel better about things. We'll find out next chapter.